All right, so I'm gonna let everyone in and we'll okay. just say hello, hello and um, I am letting everyone in. Hi everyone, thanks for your patience. We're, um, lots of people are just joining us and we're getting set up. So um, just give us another minute or two to um, let some of our uh, folks coming in. It's 9.02, thank you for being on time. Uh, we will start in just a minute. Um, and thanks, thanks, Colleen, um, for um, uh, starting the chat up. Um, and as we get started, um, feel free to add a chat. Um, just say hello, um, who you are. Um, I know most folks are joining us from the Bay Area, um, but if you're joining in from around the country, um, drop us a line, tell us where you are. Um, I know we have a lot of people who have joined our the Jokomomo trips in the past, joined us with Deborah to Brazil twice. Um, so feel free to drop us a line in the chat. And also, um, as the presentation goes on, um, please feel free to um, put your questions in the chat. Um, <clears throat> and I will uh, be reading those um, at the end. I, th I think probably we could, we got, we have a lot to go through tonight and uh, I want to make sure Deborah has as much time as, sh as she can. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and uh, uh, jump in because my intro, I can always get together with people uh, later and talk more, but just kind of wanted to do a, a quick intro of, of everyone. Uh, hi everyone. My name is uh, Bob Pullum. Uh, I'm a member of the Battery. I'm also uh, a member of the board of Docomomo US. Um, I, uh, I'm not actually an architect myself, but uh, I uh, have always loved mid-century design. Um, I think we're, when I got involved with Docomomo is when I actually bought uh, a house in Diamond Heights in San Francisco, which is a neighborhood that was developed in the 60s. Uh, I was able to kind of learn more about the history through the chapter as well as the chapter has done tours in the neighborhood as well as I, I was able to kind of find out uh, places where I could find vintage photographs of, uh, of the neighborhood. My, my neighborhood's, or my street is actually over uh, on the left there, um, which, was, which was very cool. Uh, the Docomomo chapter, uh, the Northern California chapter of Docomomo has done some uh, great tours in the Bay Area. Um, uh, we've done uh, a great tour of the art and architecture uh, of the BART system uh, during the SF Design Week, and we've repeated this tour several times. It's very, very interesting. Lots of uh, design and thought went into that, uh, as well as uh, during the, every year we have a, a, a national tour day from Docomoma US and all the local chapters uh, do tours of modernism. And, and last year we did uh, Chinatown, which was uh, modernism in Chinatown, which was very interesting. Uh, this year we'll be doing a, a, a more of a virtual tour. And um, to, I'm sure you've all kind of wondered like, what is Docomomo? What does that mean? What are they about? Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Liz Watekas, our executive director, who will be able to take you in to a little bit more detail. I'm still letting people in, Bob. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I am, uh, I am doing double duty here. Um, Can I help you? No, no. Okay. Good. Um, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Liz Waitakis from Docomoma US. I'm the executive director. Um, we are based out of New York City, um, but we have chapters all over the country. Um, so just a little quick introduction to who is uh, Docomomo um, uh, and what our funny little acronym uh, stands for. So Docomomo stands for uh, the documentation and conservation of buildings of the modern movement. Uh, buildings like uh, 
the TW, TWA Center um, in uh, New York was actually our very first advocacy issue. Um, they wanted to take this building down um, because it was no longer um, fit the criteria of uh, a modern airport. Um, and this is um, probably Docomomo's biggest save um, in the country. And it just opened um, earlier this year um, so that you can uh, uh, stay in it because it's uh, the TWA Hotel. Um, a little bit more about Jokomomo, just so you know uh, what we do. Uh, Jokomomo US is dedicated to the preservation of modern architecture, landscape, and design through advocacy, education, and documentation. We provide leadership and knowledge by demonstrating the importance of modern design principles, including the social context, technical merits, aesthetics, and the setting of these important pieces of American history. And so what does that look like? When people think modernism, you know, they're usually thinking about aesthetics, uh, but there really are um, four elements of modernism um, that we look at. The first is uh, the social efforts. So here, Lucan's um, Trenton Bathhouse in New Jersey. Uh, technical achievements. Um, this is uh, the GM Technical Dome um, in Michigan by Errol Saarinen. Uh, aesthetics. Um, we all know and love Philip Johnson's beautiful glass house uh, in New Canaan, Connecticut. And setting context. Um, this is uh, Sea Ranch uh, by uh, Charles Moore, Lyndon, Turnbull, and Whitaker on the Sonoma Coast. Um, and so primarily, um, Jokomomo um, is an advocacy and education organization. Um, by advocacy, we mean um, advocating for um, buildings that are threatened. Um, on the left-hand side, um, you'll see uh, the Paul Rudolph designed Burroughs Welcome uh, building in North Carolina. Um, it's currently threatened. Um, I had a two-hour um, conference call this afternoon with my colleagues in North Carolina. Um, and we support um, people all over the country, if not all over the world, um, in saving uh, these great examples of modernism. Um, we also, well, I see people are still coming in. Um, on the education side, um, events such as this, uh, we have a national symposium that takes place every year somewhere in the country where we give fantastic tours. Um, we do have an awards program and then um, travel tours, um, which uh, Bob is going to tell you more about. Yeah, uh, the travel tours, um, since I've uh, been a, a board member, I've been fortunate enough to go on two of these. Uh, uh, once in the past, Mexico City up at the top, and as well as you're getting ready to go on the Brazil tour that, or at highlights of the Brazil tour that I went on. Uh, we found that the uh, travel tours really uh, we're a nonprofit and it's, uh, uh, it's become a very big uh, support financially for the, for the organization. And, uh, um, you know, we plan, of course, you know, in, in the future to uh, have uh, upcoming ones such as in Finland, uh, uh, another one in Mexico City, uh, and then a, a TBD. Uh, we'd, <laughs> we love Deborah to come back as a, as a, as a host again, whether it's uh, Morocco or Brazil tour, or uh, it would just be very uh, um, great to have Deborah back as another host. So, um, and with that, I would love to introduce uh, Deborah Barros right now. Uh, she's an architect uh, at PBW Architects in New York City. She attended University of Brasilia in Brazil and has a master's degree in historic preservation from Columbia University. Uh, our longtime president, Teo Perdone, uh, is uh, uh, a professor there at Columbia University leading preservation. Um, Deborah's worked on several residential projects uh, and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and this, well, this was uh, uh, the tour that we were on in uh, Brasilia, one of my, uh, the highlights, highlight, highlighted trip of my life. Um, I've always wanted to go there and uh, was fortunate enough to experience it with uh, Deborah. That's her in the middle with our group. 
Um, and uh, with that, I'm excited to uh, present her uh, to you guys to uh, take us on this virtual tour of Brazil. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a true joy to be here tonight, and I want to thank you, The Battery, Liz, and Bob, for hosting us. Um, I was just <laughs> looking at the, at the slide. So anyway, it's a big joy to be here for a number of reasons. Um, first, I thank for anyone who goes on these trips, uh, at least for me, it's a, a remarkable, memorable experience because we are able to see the work by so many relevant, talented, wonderful designers and to understand their history, to understand the context of how this architecture emerged in Brazil and how it ties into the movement, the modern movement at the time is just something that's a full immersion experience that we do in 10 days. So um, for me, it's a joy to just talk about it and, and, and live this experience again. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we are gonna present it today to you in a slightly different manner. Naturally, when you are in Brazil, and this is a 10 day trip, we visit three cities. We go to Sao Paulo, Brasilia, and Rio. And in each city, we visit an average of five, sometimes six, sometimes four sites a day. So it's a, it's a very intense trip, but very rich at the same time. So today, um, we curated the experience by highlighting the work of the three of the most, I think, internationally well-known Brazilian architects, uh, Oscar Niemeyer, to your left, Lina Bobardi at the center, and Roberto Bullermarx, the artist and landscape designer. Uh, we are going to start with Oscar Niemeyer. Um, there we go. Um, Oscar Niemeyer was born in Rio de Janeiro in 1907. Um, he studied at the School of Fine Arts in Rio. Um, by the 1930s, uh, the, the, the scene, I would say the architecture scene in Brazil was very much French Beaux-Arts. Uh, Rio was a very French uh, city in flavor. And um, at that time, uh, Lucio Costa, who was a mentor to Oscar Niemeyer, had become uh, the director of the School of Fine Arts. So he had a very short tenure as the director of the school, but that year was just enough for him to bring to school some of the immigrant architects who were coming, bringing the European concepts that were being discussed by Le Corbusier in France, some Italian architects that were immigrating, also discussing the issues of industrialization in architecture. And Oscar Niemeyer, the Brazilian architects, are exposed to this, to this intellectual um, environment of the school. By 1936, Le Corbusier returns to Brazil. His first trip to Brazil was in 1929, where Lucio Costa actually met him. Uh, Le Corbusier meets Oscar Niemeyer in the occasion of the design for the Ministry of Education and Health in Brazil, which is now Ministry of Education and Culture. So you can see that from a very early age, 1936, Niemeyer is 29 years old, and his circle includes people like Le Corbusier. Um, in 1939, after working in the office of Lucio Costa, Niemeyer had proved his talent already, and he's working with Lucio Costa that you see on this small thumbnail to your right. I'm not sure if you can see my cursor. Uh, Lucio Costa uh, did the world's, um, the Brazilian Pavilion in the New York World's Fair of 1939, and Niemeyer worked with him on that. Um, then, you know, these works are being published in international magazines, and by 1942, the former governor of the state of Minas Gerais, uh, Juscelino Kubitschek, commissions Niemeyer to design sort of an entertainment center club um, around an artificial lake in Minas Gerais in the city of Belo Horizonte called the Pampulha Complex. And there Niemeyer designs uh, four magnificent buildings, um, which was a casino, which now is a museum. Um, he designs a yacht club, he designs a dance hall and a church. Also, uh, we are gonna see some photographs, so I'll just give you the summary, the introduction first. Then in 1947, Nehemiah is part of the group of architects who are designing the United Nations here in New York uh, under the coordination of Wallace Harrison. Um, again, he's working side to side uh, with Le Corbusier. 
Then I highlight to you that in 1954, he becomes a member of the Brazilian Communist Party. Uh, Nehemiah did not believe that architecture could change the world. He thought that it was um, almost an obligation of the architect to do his design and to uh, also work in social um, political causes. Uh, by 1956, and um, Juscelino Kubitschek, who was, remember, the governor of Minas Gerais State, now he's the president of Brazil, and he builds Brasilia from 1956 to 1960, and he wants Nehemiah to do the design. Nehemiah goes back and says, no, let's do, I'll do the architecture, but let's do a competition for the urban design, and in the competition, Lucio Costa won. And then um, in 1964, um, after Juscelino is no longer president, that's when the military dictatorship starts in Brazil. Naturally, Nehemiah being a member of the Communist Party and having the headquarters and archives and documents of the Communist Party in his office, his office got raided, he said, I'm leaving Brazil, and he decides to open up an office in Paris. From Paris, he works in very well-known international projects such as the Communist Party headquarters um, in France. He works in Italy, he works in Algeria. Um, and then at the end of the communist, I mean the dictatorship, which was uh, in 1985, in the early 80s, uh, the political environment is a little more loose uh, in terms of the military dominance and Nehemiah returns and he continues doing um, being prolific and doing work until he passes away in 2012 at the age of 104. So with this general overview, let's highlight, um, let's see some, oh, sorry, some of his, uh, the works that I was talking about. So here you see 1936, he's 29 years old. Lucio Costa was invited by the Minister of Education, um, Gustavo Capanima, to design um, a new headquarters for the ministry. Uh, at the time, Brazil was under the government of Getulio Vargas, who was a populist president who eventually became a dictator on his populist platform. And the architecture of the period, he, you know, he had very, let's say, um, conservative designs done in other ministries. But at the same time, the language of the architecture of the modern movement and the ideas that were coming out of Europe would fit well the agenda of portraying Brazil as a country of the future, of, as, as a country that is becoming developed. I mean, up to this point in Brazil, uh, only 30% of the population knew how to read and write. So you're talk, talking here about a group of young architects who are, um, to a certain extent, the educated elite, who, are now, who now have uh, a group of intellectuals running the, minist the Ministry of Education and that was just a golden opportunity that Lucio Costa embraced, but he said, if you're gonna do this project, we need to do two things. First, I would like to open it to a group of architects. So he brings his students from the school and colleagues who are working along the lines of the modern movement. And then he also says, and we need Le Corbusier as the advisor. So, uh, I mean, you, you gotta imagine the context here you have an architect going straight to the president and saying, you cannot have this ministry unless you bring Le Corbusier here. You must fly this man here. And that's what he finally convinced Getulio Vargas. And here came Corb. And uh, what you see on the screen is actually um, more of a Brazilian team adaptation because Le Corbusier wanted the project in another site. And this final solution was very much influenced by the work of young, ne uh, young Nehemiah. Um, to the right, you see um, images of the Brazilian Pavilion in the New York World's Fair. Um, again, Lucio Costa and Oscar Niemeyer. Uh, you see here some traces of Niemeyer architecture, which he develops in other of his future pro uh, projects, such as the ramps and this kind of architectural promenade and this uh, meandering into the building, um, you know, the curves. Um, you see the double height uh, pillow T, which you have on the left, and here he also creates this mezzanine view. So some of his, um, I would say, kind of trademark gestures start to take shape. Um, these photos show the complex of the Pampulha, which was uh, commissioned by Kubitschek in 1942, which I explained earlier. On the top right-hand corner is the church. 
Um, the engineer that made this viable was uh, engineer Joaquin Cardoso, with whom Nehemiah works later in life. And here you see another very important principle of Brazilian modern architecture, which in definitely Nehemiah's architecture, which is the integration of art with architecture. So you also always or usually have mural, murals with uh, artworks, in this case here by Candido Portinari, uh, who was a very uh, celebrated, well-known artist at the time. Uh, top, uh, top side, we have a, the museum um, nowadays, which was the casino, the yacht club, and the dance hall on the lower right-hand corner. Fast. Um, here we have a view of the United Nations headquarters. Um, on the right hand corner, you see young Nehemiah surrounded by much older architects. And here on the lower right hand corner, him thinking really hard, you know, almost all architects in this group have this photo thinking really hard over the project. Um, I think what Nehemiah was considering here is the fact that Le Corbusier was actually pushing him not to present his own design. Eventually, uh, Wallace Harrison told Nehemiah, present your own design. Corbusier then wanted to merge his design with Nehemiah and Nehemiah gracefully uh, joined his scheme with, with uh, Corbusier's, which is very much what we see built today. Um, so all these works, these early works of Brazilian modern architecture and Nehemiah's works were uh, published and uh, exhibited at the Museum, Museum of Modern Art in New York and were consolidated in the book Brazil Builds by Philip Goodwin. And then a few years later, another exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art that featured a number of other Brazilian architects was uh, Latin American architecture since 1945, which is uh, registered, uh, recorded in the uh, book uh, by Henry Hussle Rich, uh, Hitchcock in 1955. So here we see one of the great delights of the Docomomo tours, which is the fact that Docomomo has many chapters all over the world. So we usually um, partner up with local uh, chapters and then they give us this behind the scenes tours of buildings. In this case is the Ministry of Education and, and Health, um, which has been closed to the public for restoration for a few years now. And two years back to back, we took our group there and uh, one of the directors of the Institute of National Patrimony, uh, National Heritage, um, gave us a private tour of the most important areas of this building, including the rooftop gardens uh, by Burle Marx, um, also this garden here, which was the minister's private garden, and it's just a really special experience. Uh, another, um, Behind the scenes tour that we had was at the Canoas House by uh, Oscar Niemeyer, built in 1951. This was the architect's residence, and it's just this folly, this jewel encrusted in the, you know, in the tropical forest, um, where you have the social uh, part of the program of the house on this ground floor, and then as the terrain slopes down, he puts the bedrooms or what would, be, what would be the basement and the bedrooms overlook the Guanabara Bay. Um, here you see at the center, his grandson, Ricardo Niemeyer, who opened the house for us. The house was closed because as you can see, it's in need of restoration, but he made an exception and gave us a tour with the group um, the second time uh, last year. Here's our happy group, Bob Pullum on the left, smiling, happy with his camera, everybody <laughs> photographing until they dropped. I mean, this architecture, this, the, 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 you know, the sinuous architecture of Nehemiah just lends itself to amazing photography. We have had uh, uh, the Komomo members that won prizes on the photography they took on these trips. Um, here we see, again, speaking of curves, this is another site we visit, which is the Berapuera Park built uh, around design around, around 51 and 54. There are several Nehemiah buildings, five different buildings. They are interconnected by, again, a sinuous canopy. So um, a lot of the architecture of Nehemiah is about exploring curves when the rest of the world was exploring the line, when Le Corbusier was defending the straight line and Nehemiah was thinking man-made straight line. The, the curve is in nature. 
and that's what he would like he would like to celebrate um, another site we visited uh, during our second trip was the Latin America Memorial to the left to your left this is an um, it's a project that's a bit controversial some people find that this is not the highlight of Nehemiah's design with this bleeding hand um, and then you arrive at Brasilia uh, Brasilia again was commissioned by President Juscelino Kubitschek that transferring transferring the capital from Rio to Brasilia was already in the Brazilian Constitution for many years but Juscelino uh, the, uh, the transferring the capital was one of Juscelino's main political platforms to win his campaign and bring development to the interior of the country so based on his relationship with Nehemiah well established already uh, he invited Nehemiah to design the buildings. Nehemiah asked for the competition for the design of the city, which Lucio Costa won. So here you see Nehemiah presenting his designs to Juscelino and his team. So this is the basic design um, of Brasilia. You see that to the right and left, you have the residential wings. And then north and south, you have the monumental axis where all the administrative government buildings are um, laid out. So I, every time I press the jump slides, um, sorry for, about that. So here you can see uh, this beautiful aerial photo looking east. This is also uh, a man-made lake, just like the Pampulia complex, the residential wings right and left, the monumental axis with the ministry buildings and the three power square at the very tip of this airplane, even though the desire wasn't not to, to uh, imitate the shape of an airplane, it was more like uh, Lucio Costa described as a man who takes ownership of the land with the sign of the cross, you know, which is a metaphor that makes sense for a highly Catholic country. Um, I love these images. Many of them were taken by photographer Marcel, Marcel Guterro. Um, Brasilia was literally in the middle of nowhere. This is like savanna type of environment, um, low trees, shrubs, and a plateau 3,000 feet high uh, with this desert-like uh, environment that can be very hot during the day and cool at night. So um, what I think is fascinating about the history and for anybody who visits Brasilia is to understand that the whole city was designed and built very much in four years, definitely all the monumental axes. So to the right, you see the, the skeleton, the structural skeleton of the ministries. Um, to the left, you see on the top, the residential buildings. A cluster of a few residential blocks were built from early on, which set the stage and the standard for what the residential buildings should be. They always had a commercial strip that could, be, could service the community at a local level. Um, and then the, the photos uh, below are of the Congress um, under construction. Um, Northern Brazil uh, was underdeveloped at the time and a lot of people migrated for Northern Brazil seeking a better life uh, in Brasilia, you know, in this land of the future, you know, seeking all this development that was being promised. So I think uh, here we can see what Brasilia was from the day of inauguration to these days you have to the right the community of people, humble people who actually made this dream a reality, and to the left the politicians um, who are, you know, coordinating and not necessarily, you know, making the city emerge from the red sand because red soil because that's what was there. Um, and here you can see the pride and awe that they all had in being part of this um, epic story. Um, here we have a view of the Supreme Federal Court. If you are east, this would be a south view. This is in the three power square. So you have the Supreme Federal Court with the glass open facing the executive power right across the plaza. And um, let's see if you got north, west of it, you have the Congress and Senate forming a triangle of all the powers watching each other. Here's the Congress building. This is another one where we've been generally, um, generously hosted by um, architects, local architects who work on the preservation of this building. Uh, to the right, 
that uh, shape facing up is the, the roof of the Congress and to the left is the roof of the Senate House. And here is our first group walking on that slab at sunset. So right now, nobody's allowed to go there, but they've been very generous in allowing us to do this, just like the construction workers did in the inauguration day. And it was just a fantastic memory to see the sunset from the spot. Um, this is the, one of the views of the interior of the Congress. Um, you see too in the background uh, the integration of art and architecture with uh, panels designed by Athos Bulcão, an artist that uh, worked in tandem with Nehemiah decorating many of Brazilia's uh, buildings. And this is a snapshot showing some of Nehemiah's furniture. You know, Oscar Nehemiah didn't really design furniture for his buildings, or that wasn't his primary concern. You could understand he has a city to build in four years, so furniture was not in the forefront of his mind. <laughs> but uh, and then his daughter, uh, his daughter actually ended up designing um, a lot of the, doing a lot of the interiors for his buildings. Uh, and here you see our group enjoying that inside of the Congress building as well. So you see the lounge chairs from 1971, and I think it's a moment in which Nehemiah could finally um, dedicate, um, you know, some of his time really for that. Um, here, another uh, example of artworks that you see in these buildings to the left, uh, tapestry by Roberto Buller Marx, and to the right, this sculptural wall by Atlas Bulcão, and more tiles by Atlas Bulcão. Here we visited the National uh, Theater, uh, which was designed by Nehemiah, but detailed by Milton Hummus. This beautiful sculptural stair. Again, the panel on the outside is uh, by Atos Bulcão. This is the foyer with uh, the gardens by Burle Marx. An interior view of the cathedral. The glass, the stained glass uh, was added later in the 80s by, designed by Mariani Piretti. This is one of my favorite buildings in the tour, uh, which is the Ministry of International Affairs. Uh, this was a later building that actually was detailed by Milton uh, Ramos. Uh, we see sculpture by Bruno Giorgi and gardens by Burle Marx. Some of the interior views, again, we have this breathtaking <laughs> stair and beautiful gardens by Burle Marx and the artwork that we see in this building is also remarkable. Um, Following chronologically, we go back to Sao Paulo, which is our first stop of the trip to the Copan building, which was designed between 61 and 66. Nehemiah is involved in Brasilia, so he's pretty much does the beginning, uh, like the schematic design, and transfers uh, transfer this commission over to uh, architect Carlos Lemos. The Copan building has a zip code of its own, has over, over a thousand apartments that vary from studios to four bedroom apartments. Uh, through the Comomo, we get to visit one of the apartments uh, through uh, the, the niece of one of my former professors who lives there. So that's fun as well. Um, and we, this is also a, a building that's iconic. Uh, we added it to the tour in the city of Niteroi next to Rio, one of the later works of Nehemiah from 1996. And then I'll leave you with the Nehemiah portion of our tour today, of our highlights tour. Uh, Nehemiah is saying that he created his architecture with courage and idealism, but also with an awareness of the fact that was, what was important in life, friends and attempting to make this unjust world a better place to live, in which to live. And on that note, we move to another giant, um, Italian Brazilian architect, Lina Bobardi. She was born in 1914 in Rome. Um, her father was a construction, uh, was in construction and was a contractor. And, uh, you know, Lina comes uh, from an Italy at the time where women were expected to be um, the mothers, to be at home, to be productive, and if you will, reproductive, right? Uh, Lina didn't really agree with that very much. And she had from a very early age a spirit of resistance. So in 1940, after completing her studies in Rome, she decides to move to Milan because she felt that Milan was the intellectual center of Italy at the time and that the rest of the country, particularly Rome, was too stagnant 
in the principles of classical architecture and history. When she arrives in Milan, she's working with uh, no one as in Gio Ponti, who tells her straight out that she's not gonna get paid, that she should pay him to work for him. And there she was working from Monday through Sunday, nonstop doing a lot of the work in his studio, including um, editing the magazine Stile, and he was also uh, publishing uh, Domus. Uh, based on that experience, oh, I clicked by accident, I'm sorry. Um, Lina also worked in a number of magazines. Her editorial uh, experience was vast, and she did this more um, intellectual magazines, but also worked in more, let's say, uh, popular uh, magazines such as Vitrina, Tempo, and Grazia. Um, and then here comes the war, and Lina develops uh, leftist, leftist beliefs, and she actually is part of the, the Communist Party. Um, and she is just devastated by the impact of the war uh, in, in, in her country. And then when she met um, curator, art dealer, um, Pietro Maria Bardi, she ends up uh, marrying him, who was 14 years older and had some fascist ties, which is kind of interesting, uh, an interesting combination, but nonetheless, uh, Pietro Maria Bardi uh, already has connections in Brazil. Why? Because he met uh, Assis Chateaubriand, who was a mogul of communication uh, in Brazil uh, and had a newspaper called Diários Associados. And he met him at the inauguration of the Ministry of Education and Health. So Chateaubriand, who was um, uh, an art collector, wanted Bardi to create art institutions in Brazil and help him with his collections. So uh, based on that initial contact, the, the Bardis go to Rio in 1946, but eventually they realize that the money at the intellectual elite is also in, in, in Sao Paulo, and particularly the money is in Sao Paulo, which was the highly industrialized city at the time. So in 47, they settle in Sao Paulo. In 47, Lina is already designing a museum of modern art in the building of the newspaper of Assis Chateaubriand. By 1948, she is um, founding a design, uh, furniture design shop called Palma Studio. And by the 50s, she is editing a magazine, Habitat. And for this magazine, she used to have a male pseudonym to publish her editorials. Um, in 1951, she designs her own house, the glass house, which we visit on the tour. And then between 57 and 68, she not only designs the Museum of Modern Art, but also is starting to work in Northeastern Brazil where she's exposed to uh, folklore, crafts, and a much, a much simpler way of, of life, which has a huge influence in her work. Um, Lina was about seeing uh, the soul of Brazil in a way that I don't think other architects had ever looked at before. Um, she was able to see value in, in, in the native roots of Brazil and bring it to the foreground expressing in, in her architecture. So um, she's also at the same time doing exhibitions, you know, through the contact with her husband who was running the Museum of Modern Art. She's meeting artists, putting exhibitions together, coming to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to show the works that um, at Mass. Um, by 77 and 86, she designs the SESC, which are community centers that have usually um, recreation sports uh, centers. It has, uh, usually has libraries, it has spaces for uh, just enjoyment, relaxation. So one of the most beautiful of her works is the Sesc Pompeia, which is part of her tour. Um, she also worked on the rehabilitation of the Officina Theater, which again, you know, she had a lot of uh, experience as well designing stage sets, and she brings that in a reinterpretation of adaptive reuse of theatrical spaces. Finally, Lina passes away in 1992. So um, we're going to see some of the highlights of her work. This is a view of her glass house in 1951 in the Morumbi neighborhood. At the time, this was kind of a suburban environment um, covered by natural forests. She talks about animals, snakes, all these different tropical animals that she would see surrounding the house. 
Um, this project is interesting because there is a strong separation between the social areas and also the service areas. And sometimes the project is criticized for that because it would be a perpetuation of that class system that still exists in Brazil. Um, this is a view of Lena and the entrance steps to the house. Um, a lot of her photographs are with her own work and her furniture. Uh, and this is a view of the house as we see today engulfed by the lush tropical forest. And this is our group inside the house that has this beautiful light blue vitrified tiles on the floor. Um, it's interesting to see that she mentions that Pierre Luigi Nervi, when he visited the house, he congratulated Brazilian code, which com is completely legal today. So this house would never be, be viable today. This was also visited by Max Bill, who found the house extremely elegant. Max Bill destroyed Nehemiah's house in comments, um, saying that it was not functional, it could not be reproduced. Uh, um, so this is Lena at the Museum of Art of Sao Paulo um, during construction. Here she's posing with her uh, trademark easels. Lena historically is very uh, interested in subverting the way that art was appreciated at the time. You know, this is a period in which uh, these uh, pictures, uh, artworks, were exhibited in heavy, velvety rooms. And Lena just cleans it all up, strips it all down, allowing the observer to just create their own judgment and appreciation of the piece, unencumbered by any kind of surrounding um, elements. So these easels were actually, um, when the museum opened, they were there. And then over time, the museum was subdivided and fragmented just like a regular museum. Um, I visited it like that in the early 2000s, but recently, maybe five, eight years ago, the easels were restored and we uh, usually have a guided tour with the architect who is responsible for the restoration works of the building. Here we have a general view of the museum and Sao Paulo's most important um, avenue. And here is a view of this open span. Uh, surprisingly, even though for those who are familiar with Brazilian architecture, the open span, uh, large architectural gestures with the structural um, supports that are massive and living on the disrupted space are typical. In this case was a requirement from the donor of the site there is a, an open park to the right, and he wanted an unobstructed views from the avenue through the park. Gardens are by, um, surrounding gardens are by Burle Marx. Oh, too fast again. This is just um, a section that shows you the structural system for uh, this building. It's pretty much two porticos, one that supports the floor and the other floor hangs from it. And then a lot of program also happens underground such as this gallery that we see here. Um, this is a view of the easels uh, as restored today. And then you move to the Sask Pompeia, which was a site of an old um, steel drum factory. Um, and uh, when Lena visited the site, she noticed that people from the community in Pompeia in Sao Paulo were using the place to play. People were barbecuing on the spot, doing picnics. This was a place where for leisure uh, of the community. And she also observed the Hennebeek uh, construction system of these uh, concrete porticos here. And she immediately knows, noticed the relevance and the um, historical significance of the structure. So instead of raising the original factory to the ground, she decided to preserve the factory and accommodate in uh, the pre-existing buildings more of the social, um, in leisure programs, the theatrical programs, the library uh, workshops uh, for different kinds of classes, such as um, they have sculpture, pottery, um, all different kinds of, of classes. And then she separated sports into a separate building that was the addition in, in concrete in a very raw, uh, I would say brutal um, expression. Um, Lena had a very interesting relationship to um, to life in general. What life was about enjoyment and it was about um, appreciation of life itself. So even the swimming pool in this space is not designed to Olympic competition uh, proportions. She was interested in the swimming pool as a place to play. 
Um, here you see some views of the, the factory buildings, in between factory buildings and the addition to the background. Um, here she employs her um, characteristic like trellis um, sliding windows. And uh, there's also these interconnecting bridges um, also lend themselves to fantastic pictures as we can see um, in a, um, a slide that's coming up. So here we have some views of the interior. She brings a water feature. At some point, you know, we had the fire. So this embodies what Lena calls poor architecture, but poor, you know, not in, this, in the sense of destitute, but poor in harnessing the simplest and humblest means for maximum expression. It's interesting to notice that the theater, oh, the theater that we see here, she also changes the arrangement, uh, which has allowed for uh, directors to create um, very specific um, pieces, right? Because you're not facing the audience just in one way. Uh, this is another view of the interior. You can see the screens and the care in the working with the brickwork in contrast with the raw concrete and the red elements and the infrastructure is exposed. Another view of the addition block. And another view. And here are some of the furniture pieces that Lena designed. She designed furniture, she designed uh, stage sets, she designed costumes, she designed jewelry. I mean, her uh, breadth of, of, of design work is just, uh, you know, breathtaking. Uh, this is the, ta these are the, this is the set of chairs and table for the Sesc Pompeii. Uh, in black and white, you see her sitting at her bowl chair, which her sketches are to the right. Um, and then uh, the bola chair ball chair is one that we see in her house in the glass house. And here is the her own in her own words. Oh. Every time I oh, go in her own words, the uh, her ideal of adaptive reuse not as poor architecture in the sense of destitution as they expl ex explain but as artisanal simplicity. And then we'll move on to our third uh, giant, uh, Borla Marx. Borla Marx was born in uh, Sao Paulo in 1909. Um, and in 1913, the family moved to Rio de Janeiro. Um, he comes from an erudite family and uh, he studied in, in Berlin. And there he actually used to visit the botanical gardens where he found many specimens of Brazilian flora, which sparkled in him the desire to study more about landscape. So after, after finishing his works in, um, in arts, he comes back to Brazil and he starts to collect plants. And then he lived nearby Lucio Costa and Lucio knowing about his work, invites him to do the gardens for the Schwartz house in 1932. Um, what is interesting about uh, Willem Marx is that in, the, in a similar way as Lina looked at Brazil and saw its soul in the simplest, more humble um, artisanal crafts, fol fol folklore, um, Willem Marx looked at Brazilian flora and interpreted it as being legitimate. What do I mean by it? It's because up to that point in Brazil, all the garden designs were imitating some sort of French design or English design, but nothing that would, would really take into account our own native uh, vegetation. So Bourla Marx does his first uh, the garden with native plants in 1935 at the Euclides da Cunha Square in northeastern Brazil, which is a more arid region with cacti and, and so on, which was you know, unheard of at the time. Um, in 1936, we have the Ministry of Education and Health. So by 37, he designs the gardens, receives awards for the design of the gardens. Um, in 1949, he buys a state in the Baja de Guaratiba, which is now a World Heritage Site that's uh, removed from Rio, but was a well worth trip, which we did on the second Brazil tour. There we visit um, greenhouses where he collected thousands of plant species. Uh, Burle Marx was uh, 
uh, was a Renaissance man. Not only uh, he's famous for his work in paintings, in sculpture, in jewelry, um, again, stage sets, costumes, landscape, but um, he also would go on expeditions to find plants and he discovered a number of plants that are called Bulemarxi with two eyes at the end, you know, like in Latin after his name. So um, in 19, in the 50s, he's already designing a lot of private gardens um, and he opens his own design studio and also a landscape um, uh, company, like a landscape construction contractor company. Uh, in 56, he's already doing works in Venezuela. Um, 60s and 70s, he's working in Brasilia, he's working abroad, he's working across the country. And uh, what is interesting to highlight is that, you know, 1964 is the beginning of Brazilian uh, military dictatorship. Uh, in 67, he's invited to um, actually be part of uh, a group who would advise on cultural affairs within the military government. And uh, at times he was criticized for that, for actually working within the military government. But his mindset was that he would work from within. So he wrote a number of, uh, you know, the positions or statements uh, favoring and advocating for the preservation of the environment, for, um, for, for better cities, for better, um, um, you know, communities and, and, and urban centers for more vegetation, for more landscape, and for protecting Brazilian uh, flora and fauna. So he was an early environmentalist during the brutal years, the most brutal years of Brazilian dictatorship, which were from like 67 uh, until 74. Um, and then, uh, you know, he's being featured abroad. In 1991, MoMA had an exhibition on, on his works and he passed away in 1994. So here we see a view of one of the sculptures at the Guaratiba State. I mean, when you're walking around the site, which is enormous and has uh, at least five structures for us to visit, uh, this is the kind of serene environment that we enjoy. Um, some more views of the state. A number of reflecting pools and water features. This is uh, a lodger with tiles that were designed, were designed by him. The um, uh, ch chandelier was designed by him with fruits from Brazil. Um, this is part of the house which was in restoration when we visited. Um, we can also visit uh, sort of a museum of a lot of the, his uh, uh, tapestries and objects that he designed. These are snapshots of the, his gardens at the Ministry of Education and Health. Um, this is the view of the garden at the level of the ministry's private uh, office. And this is the rooftop garden. This is, was also an addition on the second trip, which is the Moreira Salles Institute, which used to be a residence and the gardens and murals were designed by Brilla Marx. Um, this is the Flamengo Park which is a park designed uh, between the 50s and 60s under the direction of uh, Lota de Macedo Soares, who was a prominent figure of a uh, real society with strong ties to the government, at the governor at the time. Um, so Nehemiah, uh, not Nehemiah, Burla Marx did the design for the gardens, which has a number of uh, relevant buildings from the period by uh, Afonso Eduardo Heide. In the foreground, you see the modern, uh, the Museum of uh, Modern Art of Rio. Again, um, this is the Tamaraty Palace in Brasilia, a view of the gardens by Brilla Marx on the top floor. Tapestry by him. This is a garden we visited on the, with the second trip to Brazil with the second group, which is the Ministry of the Army Gardens. Um, I got this picture from, um, uh, from an aerial shot because you can see more of this kind of pictorial um, characteristic of Burla Marx's work expressed. Um, this is a picture from Liz, who uh, <laughs> we passed by this, but you know, there are so many things to see, you have to pick her battles. So this is one that she went like early on at 7 a.m. with Bob, I think, to take some pictures <laughs> as everybody else was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. uh, the Fies building mural. Um, 
And here we have a view of the Copacabana Beach Promenade by uh, Brule Marx as well. It's actually visible from the hotel where we stay in Rio. And, you know, I'll finish with a quote by Brule Marx where he says that the garden was where he could apply the fundamentals of formal composition to nature itself in alignment with the aesthetic and sensibilities of his time. So on that note, I, you know, I thank everybody for participating and showing up tonight. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll hand it over to Liz and Bob and thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> uh, that, was, that was fantastic. Thank you, thank you. And I would just say that um, Mural by Brule Marx was like two blocks from our hotel in Sao Paulo and we didn't know it was there on the first trip. That's how much there is to see, which is... It's Cannot amazing. say everything there is to be seen. <laughs> Everybody will pass, every time we pass by, you know, we need, we need months, we need months to cover all this. Well, you did a great job tonight trying to um, take, you know, 10 days of 10, 12 hour days, grueling days, but there, it's so much fun. <laughs> um, I, I know we're kind of uh, at the time, but I, I Liz, were we getting any uh, questions? I, I'm just going to leave the screen up here just to kind of uh, uh, give people more information on Docomomo, sign up for our newsletter, get involved with the chapter, of course, donate. In the fall, we have a great uh, Because uh, Modern Auction, which will be a fundraiser for the organization with a lot of uh, exclusive uh, merchandise and experiences that we're still uh, collecting right now. And then, you know, jumping on uh, sending us an email at info at docomomous.org for uh, early access to future tours. And Liz, I don't know if you want to take it from there. Yeah, um, and just about the future tour. So um, I do maintain a separate list uh, of people who are interested in our trips. Um, we do advertise our trips, um, but I, I will send out emails to uh, a smaller list telling people that this is coming up, what the dates are. Um, and our Finland trip uh, sold out before we even announced it, and then COVID hit. Um, so Finland uh, will be next year, fingers crossed. Um, and uh, yeah, we're talking about doing Mexico again next year. And then, um, yeah, if there's interest in Brazil um, doing another trip, I know Deborah and I have talked about um, what we're calling Brazil 2. Um, and it's some of the, um, we, uh, we visited Sao Paulo, Brasilia, and Rio, and there's a, a thought of going to um, some of the other cities um, throughout Brazil. Um, but let's get to questions, because I know we're running out of time. Um, so first question from Tara Quinn. Um, I'm curious to know uh, if there are any resources that Deborah recommends, um, if uh, you would like to learn more uh, about Brazilian modernism. Are there any books? All the books behind you, Deborah? <laughs> yeah, I was looking here. Uh, um, well, it depends if you want to learn about these architects or other architects in general. I mean, there are some very good books about Lina Bobardi, like this one by Ziller Lima. He's an expert on Lina Bobardi. We also have this one. It's very interesting because it's a compilation of Lena's own, Lena, Lena in her own words, Lena Bobardi um, by Casa de Vidro Institute, um, also written with architects that worked closely with her that did the Cesc Pompeo, such as Marcelo Ferraz and Andrea Weiner. Uh, Burle Marx, uh, main references that I have, I find this one as to be Highly informative by Hoffman. <laughs> <laughs> and we can try to um, provide a list. Yeah, we'll capture these later on. Maybe we do. That's maybe it's a more productive way um, to do it. <laughs> yes, there is, there is a lot published, a lot published. And I saw that there was even a question on Shantiga, which is true. There are references about it. There are books written about it. So maybe we'll just compile a little list and you can distribute it later to the attendants if you have the, their email information or to the people who ask the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, we can provide those. Great. Um, and I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, and it's something that you and I were talking about earlier today and you were talking about um, how the architects and designers were expressing 
um, uh, themselves through, what was the word that you used? Oh, Brazilianity. Brazilianity. Yes, yes, or in Portuguese would be Brasilidade. What I think it's interesting about these three architects is that even though they're, they're uh, the, the, the work, the expression of their work is so diverse, um, there is something that weaves their work together, which is this search for a Brazilian soul, the search for a genuine, genuine Brazilian expression. Because up to that point, you know, Brazil had just observed, absor absorbed the, the, the culture from either Portugal, uh, we colonized by uh, Portugal, or by uh, French. You know, a lot of Brazilians used to go abroad and study in France, you know. So they were really looking in the mirror, you know, and Lina being a foreigner and Lina being a woman in Brazil, I think that's also uh, to be taken into consideration, you know, because I think she was able perhaps to appreciate Brazil in such depth of its, you know, native soul, precisely because she came from abroad. She came from a country where our crafts were really elaborate. And in Brazil, she, was, she saw that it was humble, it was simple, but it wasn't devoid of meaning or core, you know, in its essence. And she brought that to the foreground and, and she just gave beauty and grace to it all in her designs. Um, likewise with, uh, with Burle Marx, you know, the fact that he was able to give tremendous value to the exuberance and the variety of the Brazilian flora and fauna and the differences between Northern Brazil and Southern Brazil, which were tremendous. And he collected it all and he cataloged. So he, his contribution is just uh, invaluable. And, and Nehemiah is just, um, you know, if you're going to talk about somebody that it's the right at, at the right place at the right time, and, and whose talent is just following that, that, that calling, really. That's, um, Nehemiah is a fantastic example. Um, and I think he was able to understand what was coming from abroad and to say, no, I value curves. I come from a country where Baroque uh, architecture was really uh, flourishing. I come from a, a, a country where nature is really uh, sinuous and I'm going to celebrate these curves and I'm going to make this mine, you know, and um, I think that's the gift that Nehemiah left for us with these other two uh, fantastic designers. Well, you've given all of us a gift, Deborah. Presenting. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, and when we're on these trips, amazing. And I hope we can do it again. It is amazing. Thank you so much. So, Bob, I think I think we're going to wrap up. Any uh, any uh, closing thoughts from you? Uh, no, just a big thank you to the battery for uh, hosting us, and uh, uh, looking forward to uh, uh, Colleen was interested in some other ideas that we had. So, hopefully, we'll be back with some other uh, tours of uh, virtual tours of modernism around the world probably next time in the Bay Area. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Bob. All right, well, we're gonna sign off, um, but thanks everyone for participating. For all of our friends in San Francisco and on the West Coast, please stay safe. Um, all of us on the East Coast are, are thinking about you and um, we can't wait for um, this virus to be behind us so we can start touring again. Yes. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night.